Well, hello everyone. This is uh, Mikhail Golovnia speaking. I'm a senior scientist at Salford Systems. And the topic of our webinar today will be decision trees and their, and their ensembles, a winning combination. Now, I personally spent 10 plus years of my life working on the frontier of data mining. Uh, I've been doing a lot of algorithmic work, um, a lot of consulting, research, uh, getting up to date on all of the different ideas out there. And the whole purpose of this webinar is to kind of share some of those insights and some of uh, the understanding of all the, these different technologies with you. I appreciate your taking time. Uh, I the, the whole presentation will be essentially vendor neutral, even though I will be using some of the software that I obviously have access to. Uh, during the webinar, if you have questions, and uh, we may have quite a few people out there, in the interest of time, I would advise you to write them down and then uh, communicate them to us and we can uh, easily uh, talk to you afterwards and offline on an individual basis. So that's it. Uh, let me proceed. Uh, there will be a few slides along the way, as well as uh, some of the live uh, software runs. The general course outline is uh, because we're focusing on trees and their ensembles, we will start with a single decision tree. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, even though it's the underlying key workhorse of all of the modern technologies out there. Uh, then we'll briefly talk about random forest uh, as one of the uh, very important and uh, fairly powerful techniques that utilizes the concept of uh, tree ensembles. And then we will move on to the key part of uh, this talk, which is uh, an ensemble of boosted trees or trees that are linked together into a chain. And then we'll see along the way what happens, how the modeling insights get affected, and uh, also what will be the key advantages of combining a number of different approaches together. As I have said, I spend a lot of time on the algorithmic side of things. I understand a great deal of internal technical details. Uh, given the scope of this presentation, of course, I won't be able to address uh, those in greater length, but you're welcome to ask questions afterwards. Time to introduce our main culprit, uh, one of the data sets that I've taken from some of the past experiences that we had as uh, consultants and also as uh, participants in a number of uh, data mining competitions out of there. So the data set comes from a 2006 uh, DMC data mining competition. The competition itself was uh, focused on uh, different areas of predictive modeling, including text mining. I'll leave out text mining for today. We may come up with yet another webinar at some point in the future as a continuation. Now, the, the data set is a kind of general purpose uh, data set. It has to do with uh, selling of iPods on eBay. And what they did is they took uh, one year from May 2005 to May 2006 in Germany. So we're talking about some international markets here. And overall, 8,000 uh, iPod auctions were selected. The auction items were grouped into 15 mutually exclusive categories based on size type uh, well, we all know there are different types of iPods, uh, color, capacity, uh, and uh, the actual type of the device. And the goal was to predict whether the closing price will be above or below the category average. And again, the goal itself, kind of uh, interesting here, is that basically we're trying to see what are the key variables or key dimensions associated with the uh, whether your sale will be more successful or less successful, at least with respect to the current definition of the goals. 
Uh, it's very interesting whenever you approach a new data set, and I spent quite a few years in data mining. I also have a, a, cla I'm a classically trained statistician in numeric statistics. But it always leaves me with a sense of wonder every time I see a new data set. It's like entering into a new uncharted territory as an explorer trying to figure out what's really hiding behind the wall of numbers. As far as the data set goes, uh, there is some of a sampler of the key variables. We obviously have things like category name. Uh, what, is the, what was the direction, uh, duration of auction in days? Uh, the type of auction, uh, which will be just an additional categorical variable out there. Uh, the quantity available, the amount of uh, time. Sometimes people sell one unit, other times they sell a lot. Uh, there will be some uh, feedback rating of the seller, start price, buy it now price, buy it now flag. And there will be all sorts of different flags that relate to the fees whether certain areas of that auction were activated at uh, the type uh, of uh, that, that event. Like, for example, whether you want your item to be shown in the top category or you want it to be part of the picture gallery or anything like that. And again, the data set itself is just a nice, uh, interesting, real-life example that hopefully uh, you don't have to have any domain expertise in order to understand what's going on. Treat it as a, some kind of curiosity to highlight some of the most interesting parts of our discussion. Okay, so time to go into the uh, next part, which is uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, because the key topic is stochastic gradient boosting and ensemble of trees, I want to first show how far a modeling side you can go as far as building just a single tree. Now, the single tree has uh, a number of key advantages. As written here, it's relatively fast. In fact, it is very fast on the modern, uh, uh, the, uh, the, with the, all of the uh, computers available to modern day researchers. Another advantage of a tree is that it uses all types of variables, numeric, binary, categorical, and it also supports missing values. There are other things like invariant and their monotone transformations. Uh, the tree has uh, an inherent ability to select important variables and filter out irrelevant variables. Uh, it is usually easy to run a tree right away, and the end result is nearly always an interpretable model. So what I will do here, I'll switch to the software that I have access to, and I'll start by opening the iPod eBay data set in a CSV form. And just to give you a little bit of uh, uh, general feeling for the data set. If you look at the data and what it represents, uh, the category name is uh, whatever the type of the iPod, the way it was advertised on eBay at, during that time. Uh, then we have these other things like how many days it was listed, the type of uh, auction, uh, what is the actual customer base start price, as well as a bunch of yes-no flags on the different types of fees that uh, the user could uh, pay to enhance the visibility of the product. What is also interesting here is that there is this uh, buy it now flag and buy it now price. And the buy it now price, when that option is not available, is naturally a missing value. And there is a, quite a few uh, missing values in this specific variable. Now, if I wanted to do classical statistics on this data set, that variable right there would have caused me a great amount of grief because I would have to somehow handle the missing values. Now, thanks to the technologies uh, of trees and all of the modern data mining approaches, they relieve us from all of the concerns related to categorical variables, character variables, missing values, as well as outliers. Having said that, let me build a single tree. Uh, I'll use CART as a member of uh, single tree algorithms out there. 
And in this case, uh, let me sort in file order. The GMS greater than average is the target variable of interest, binary 0, 1. Uh, all of the remaining variables except for variables that relate to the target will be my predictors. And uh, the predictors that are character in nature are automatically treated as categorical. Uh, what I will also do, the type of auction will be chosen as a categorical variable. Now, skipping all of the other uh, interesting things related to the technology itself, I'll just mention that we will partition data set into 50% learned sample, 50% trained sample. Uh, we will use some natural stopping rules. For example, each, ter each segment needs to have at least 30 records and at least 100 auctions to be eligible for subsequent splitting. And I'll use priors learn as, the pro as uh, some of the other settings. So let me hit start. And very quickly, as a confirmation of the original claim that trees are very fast, we get our first model. The nice thing about single trees is that they give you uh, some kind of general understanding of what's going on in the data set right away. I mean, it's a very cheap waiting time, cost, or price. And uh, if there's any problem in your data set, it will always pop out uh, right into your face. Now, when you look at this tree here, there are different things that you can do about it. And again, this is not the purpose of this webinar to delve into all of those details. But in general, as soon as you see something like that, you want to be interested in a few things. For example, what are the variables that were selected by the given model is most important. And it turns out it's the buy it now price, start price, the customer base, and the listing type code that were the primary drivers in this case. Uh, you're also interested in things like, okay, how well I'm doing on learn versus test sample, and what is the overall, say, area under ROC curve. Whenever you're doing some kind of study, especially on the binary classification side, you often have certain goals in mind, and they, they influence the type of uh, uh, selection criterion for your models. Now, for the rest of this webinar, I will focus on the area under ROC curve as a very popular and quite powerful uh, measure of overall classification performance. Now, in this case, the single tree achieves uh, ROC on the test sample of roughly 69%, which is, depending on how you look at it, whether they're good or not so good. Uh, but it also shows some of the key characteristics of this tree. Now, the sum of these nodes here, they have, uh, uh, as you can see, we start with roughly 50-50 partition. Uh, uh, the, there's a half of the iPods were sold above the average, another half was sold below was sold below the average, and this is just the peculiarity of this uh, data set. And then as the tree evolves, at some point uh, you're getting into the nodes that have a high number, uh, a high representation of the iPods that were sold above the average. And you can quickly double check the sanity rules, for example, okay, the highest node on the right was to set the buy it now price above 202 and the start price above 206. So if these are the starting conditions of your auction, and it kind of implies most likely that uh, you are selling an, an item that is a, is a good kind of uh, condition, et cetera, et cetera. So in that case, assuming that you did manage to complete that transaction, it's very likely that it's going to be above the average. Likewise, on the other side of this story here, you can see that if the buy it now price is less than 159, then that's all that's uh, needed to know in order to claim that there is a great chance that you will be selling below the average. The rest of the nodes kind of show intermediate situations. You have hot spots here and there, and um, you can do all sorts of other things. 
Now, sometimes bef when people look at single trees, they want to know in general tree stability. The tree stability can be shown here. And uh, again, skipping some of the details, if you were to look at the tree that's shown on the screen, that you would see that some of the nodes exhibit certain variation between learn and test performance, meaning that depending on which data set you're looking at, you get either better or worse performance. Whereas the tree that has nine terminal nodes exhibits great uh, stability in terms of agreement between learn and test. That alone, in many t uh, cases, would I would argue that, okay, you may actually simplify your story without losing that much if you look only at a single tree that has a somewhat more stable characteristics. Now, the tree that you're looking at has uh, auto C on the test sample of 65%. And when you look at the summary reports, uh, the ROC presented uh, looks like this. Now, the goal of all of the modern research, and uh, the trees, at least the ones that I'm using right now, were introduced back in 1984 as a completely, as a complete, from the statistical and theoretical perspective, methodology. And then the remaining decades, which uh, basically we're talking about 20 to 30 years of, uh, the, uh, that just passed, uh, the most of the effort was focused on how to improve predictive accuracy of a single tree and at the same time preserve the overall uh, performance of single trees. There are several uh, different uh, approaches along the way, so let me skip to the next part. And first of all, the entire research was revolving around uh, the concept of overcoming single tree disadvantages, which is uh, the trade-off between accuracy versus interpretability, a tree. Uh, yeah, there's uh, some delay on the line, so I'm trying to make sure that uh, everyone sees uh, the parts that I have on my screen. Okay, so I was talking about disadvantages. Uh, it's accuracy versus interpretability trade-off. Uh, the piecewise constant model, when you see a single model, it gives you essentially a partition of the underlying response surface into a set of piecewise constant areas. Uh, trees also exhibit instability. If you try to improve model accuracy by building larger tree, very soon you're going to hit the rock bottom and the tree will become unstable. So you will be chasing after a one specific kind of ghost image instead of seeing a fine picture that uh, you're actually trying to go after. Trees suffer from data fragmentation and they also produce, in some cases, unnecessary uh, imposed high interaction order model just because they force all of the individual variables to interact with one another. And in some cases, it's not necessarily what the underlying simplified model solution would look like. So that moves us to the next area, which is uh, three ensembles. Uh, one way to improve on the predictive accuracy of a single tree is uh, by way of constructing multiple trees, which ultimately boils down to finding a way to grow another tree that's different from the currently available. Now, assuming that that can be done, and there is a whole area of research dedicated to that topic alone, uh, but assuming that can be done and it can be repeated sufficient number of times, let's say a couple hundred, then the resulting response can be easily constructed in regression by averaging individual predictions and in classification by uh, essentially uh, uh, implementing some kind of voting schemes. So we just finished presidential elections a couple of days ago, and it's the same concept can be easily applied 
to the uh, three ensembles, when each three votes for its uh, preferred candidate, in this case the candidate will, will be the type of target with either say yes or no, or above or below average, and the end result is simply summarized by counting the number of votes. The very powerful advantages of any three ensemble approach is that the new tree starts with a complete set of data, and therefore it has the capability to re-examine or arrive at a different set of conclusions, either independently of everyone else in the model or uh, in cooperation. Here comes the fundamental fork or split on the road, which is when you combine multiple trees, uh, in order to combine them, you need to grow them. And there are the two different paradigms out there. On one side, people say, let's grow trees independently of each other so that they do not influence each other and they have an individual stab at discovering the underlying signal. And that philosophy of thought eventually leads to these so-called bootstrap aggregation techniques uh, or bagging techniques or ultimately random forest, which is what we'll talk about in the next slide. On the other side, there is a different school of thought that says you should not be wasting time over and over again on arriving at individual components of the signal independently you may actually benefit by building modeling stages uh, such that each subsequent stage attempts to learn a little bit more from what has already been learned and it also attempts to correct possible errors of the preceding stages. Now that whole line of thought eventually led to the concept of boosting models, boosted trees, and ultimately stochastic gradient boosting which is what we will talk in the second half of this webinar. So that comes to the three ensembles. But let's look at the first part, uh, first of all, how one could get multiple trees grown independently. So at this point, I enter the bootstrap aggregation uh, school of thought. There are different methods that are available. If you have access to uh, unbelievably large volume of data, and nowadays it's becoming more and more uh, uh, commonplace, then you could grow trees on uh, independently drawn, non-overlapping samples from that large database. There are other approaches when you can grow, peop uh, grow trees with uh, different uh, control settings, uh, including prior probabilities. No time to delve into the details there. Uh, other approach that is most common these days is grow trees on bootstrap samples. And the bootstrap sampling procedure is essentially the procedure that takes uh, a set of random draws with replacement. So it takes the existing data set and then a, a collection of uh, a random draws with replacement uh, taking place such that the same record can be included multiple times in the resulting data set that is called the bootstrap sample, uh, bootstrap sample. Now there are some nice statistical properties about this sampling with replacement procedure. Namely, about 38% of the original sample is excluded from the bootstrap sample. So there, just by the very nature of the procedure, you're forcing the follow-up model to be looking at uh, not the entire data set, but some uh, substantially smaller part of it. About 37% of the original sample is included exactly once, and the remaining records are included more than once. And there is a, uh, one possible sample of a bootstrap, uh, bootstrap run that shows for the data set that originally had 2,000 records, what is the resulting distribution, or how many records from the original sample entered into this specific invocation of a bootstrap sample run. And uh, as you can see, there's all sorts of uh, possibilities out there. And combinatorially, you can get a large number of different configurations. 
Now, what is also important here is that once you step on the bootstrap sampling road and later on on the boosting road, uh, because of uh, incompleteness of individual iteration, you have to produce large number of iterations in order to gain some substantial insight and improvement in performance. Now, random forest has an approach that was uh, developed by Leah Bryman and Adele Cutler at the University of California at Berkeley as a kind of a culmination of this entire line of thought of uh, constructing models using a bootstrap aggregation approach uh, around single trees. And the algorithm itself is uh, relatively straightforward and can be easily implemented and introduced. It would be a nice project for some advanced uh, uh, computer science graduate student out there. Uh, but in RF algorithm, each tree is grown in a bootstrap sample from the learning sample. And furthermore, as a tree is constructed at each node, a random selection of p variables is uh, selected. And it's that subset of variables is the only set that's eligible at that point to enter into the tree structure. So basically, you do a lot of random draws. You do random draws from the sample. You do random draws from variables. And then you keep stamping trees over and over and over again, like a gigantic tree factory. And the end result, you're hoping that once you average things together, you will essentially either improve predictive accuracy or discover some additional parts of the data that were not available there uh, to the single tree. So let me take this random forest approach and quickly illustrate what it means with respect to our little project out here. So I'm back to the software. Uh, and again, there are a lot of different implementations of random forest out there. I'm just using the one that I have access to. So random forest is uh, my approach. Same collection of variables as before including the target and the predictors, a mixture of categorical, continuous, binary, character, etc. cetera. 50% uh, uh, as a test sample, even though random forest itself can easily do away with the test sample, uh, but we're not going to focus on that for now. Uh, I'll use it with unit class weights. And as far as the random forest itself goes, I'll construct 300 trees and I will require each tree to be grown to the largest possible size, meaning you want to build tree as far as possible. I also turn off other fancier features of random forest, click start. And as you can see, compared to a single tree approach, now we do have to wait for the model to complete. There is no such thing as free lunch, after all, even though some people think that it is the case. It never is. And uh, in this case, we are hoping to get a better performance by applying bootstrap procedure around uh, a single tree in order to build multiple trees and then average things together and see what happened. And again, I'll skip some fine details here, go straight into the summary reports. I'm interested in test ROC. And uh, in this case, I'm going to increase the granularity of my bins just to see in general how far I can go. And again, it's instructive to see that the individual tree there, we had uh, ROC on the test at around 65%, whereas uh, once I got into the RF model here, I'm getting into like 67%. So not substantial improvement on this data set, but it does highlight certain things. As far as the variable importance go, again, the ones that we already suspected before, like start price, buy it now price, category name, customer base, uh, listing type code, they are kind of entering into the gameplay here. Also notice, quite interestingly, for both single tree and random forest model, all of those fee variables are at the bottom, which kind of basically tells us that if you are selling something uh, 
What's more important is what you sell and not how you're trying to sell it. Now the fee potentially might improve your visibility or make your transaction happen faster or anything, but ultimately it boils down to your price, which we're kind of assuming it boils down to the quality of the product or the condition of the product that you are selling, and there is nothing you can do as far as the fees go to improve your odds of selling it above or below average. So that's one side. Now, what's also interesting is to superimpose gains from these two models. So I have a single tree model and a random forest model on the test sample and try to see what happened here. And an interesting kind of striking result here is that for whatever reason, some of the peculiarities of this data set, and that kind of remains to be seen in the next round of development. A random forest exercise, the nice capability to predict uh, high level sales and then it kind of drop the ball later on such that we don't really get that nice performance there. But at the same time, we are getting overall integrated performance that's at a somewhat higher level. Okay, let me close this and uh, switch back to slides. <clears throat> and the way I see it, and that kind of traces our consulting practice, it's very easy to build a single tree to weed out obvious errors and problems. It's also very easy to build a random forest model to see whether you can gain some substantial improvement. Oftentimes it works, other times it doesn't, but it never makes your performance worse than a single tree. And in this case, on this specific data set, this is what happens, uh, and uh, it was worth a try. Our next approach is to exercise this alternative branch of uh, modeling thought, which is a stochastic gradient boosting. Now, the approach itself was introduced by Jerome Friedman of Stanford University, and uh, Jerry is uh, one of the original co-authors of uh, CART, the, the popular single tree approach. Uh, Jerry also produced things like multivariate adaptive regression splines, uh, projection pursuit, other types of approaches out there. Uh, the stochastic gradient boosting itself is uh, nicely designed to handle classification and regression problems. It's built on small trees, and therefore it's fast, efficient, it's always this data driven. Uh, it's resistant to overtraining and can be remarkably accurate with little effort. And as always, it comes at a price, which is the resulting models may still be very complex. So that is uh, the for the remainder of this session today, I'll try to highlight some of the peculiarities of working with stochastic gradient boosting models. But first and foremost, let me introduce the algorithm. And again, this time, we're going to begin with a very small tree as an initial model. The small meaning really small could be as little as one split generating two terminal nodes. And later I will run it just to illustrate some of the interesting insights coming out of that model. Obviously a small tree cannot explain everything. Therefore, there is this concept of residuals or the current errors of the tree or the errors that communicate things that have not yet been explained because ultimately we are hoping that we can explain everything except for the noise component that is unavoidable. So then the second tree is grown to predict the residuals from the first tree. Once you have those, you can calculate the resulting residuals, the residuals of the two tree model and grow the third tree to predict revised residuals and continue in that fashion uh, until you exhaust uh, your passion, time, or computer resources. 
It can be presented pictorially as the model being built in stages 3, 1, plus 3, 2, plus 3, 3, plus etc., etc. Of course, if you are overly zealous in doing this, it's inevitable that at some point that sequence will be able to predict everything that it can about the learned sample. And it kind of necessitates the importance of having an independent check on an independently drawn test sample or something related to the test sample. And also, you have to be very careful in how you go about building those individual trees. So you do not want to overtrain your model by extracting uh, more signal at each individual iteration that is actually uh, necessary. Uh, as far as the algorithmic details, the stochastic gradient boosting has a very solid underlying statistical foundation uh, that works with uh, all sorts of concepts like likelihood functions, loss functions, loss functions based on likelihood functions, the type of targets, the type of predictive modeling. So you could work with regression type solutions with multiple variables on the continuous targets. You could also get uh, logistic regression solutions, which is the type of problem that I'm working with today. You can do multinomial classification. You can also do things like Poisson regression when you're trying to model the occurrence of certain events, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, typically uh, relates to insurance industry applications. You can also do survival models, which uh, deal with the survival time, including censoring, and so on and so forth. So it's a very uh, advanced and flexible approach designed to effectively handle any type of specific applications out there. Now, TreeNet operates, as you can see from this generic description of the algorithm, on the pretense of uh, boosting, uh, where the model is built in stages. And each individual trees, they are also combining the, some elements of uh, random forest to the extent that each individual tree is exposed to a variant of bootstrap sample from the original data set. Now the reason this is done is we want to break the dependency of individual structural blocks of any model from the most influential observations. And when you draw a bootstrap sample or a random sample without replacement the way it's implemented inside of the tree net, or uh, Jerry Friedman's implementation of stochastic gradient boosting, uh, you have access to the possibility to exploit all of the different parts of this signal and uh, break away from some of the influential records. Then on top of it, there's also ways to slow down the learning process and it it's uh, introduced by the concept of a learn rate that once each individual tree is grown, instead of taking the full magnitude of its predictions, uh, they are shrunk towards zero. And this way, the entire learning process uh, takes a much more slower pace. And there are also some other enhancements that may or may not be relevant to the specific type of application at hand. So let me take uh, our data set and make a real software run, this time uh, looking at uh, the stochastic gradient boosting approach. Okay, so I'm going back to my modeling setup. I'm choosing 3Net. Now, 3Net is uh, our implementation of stochastic gradient boosting. So those are uh, terms that are representing the same thing. Uh, notice I'm working with the again, same modeling configuration. Logistic binary is the type of my uh, modeling approach. Uh, same thing, 50% learn and test. And it's very important to have test sample in uh, uh, gradient boosting model. Now, I already mentioned the concept of learn rate. Uh, just for the sake of simplicity, I will use 10% learn rate for the upcoming run. 
uh, there will be 200 trees, each tree will have six nodes, and each individual tree will be grown on a randomly selected 50% sample of the learned data. Again, we are talking about stochastic gradient boosting. Now, boosting already explained. Stochastic comes from this subsample fraction, which means that not the entire portion of the learned sample is exposed at all times. And the gradient uh, means that some of the fundamental internals of the algorithm have to do with the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to individual observation components, which is basically a vector of grad uh, the, the gradient for that specific loss function. And again, the tree nut has some beautiful underlying theory. I'm pretty sure those of you who are uh, more mathematically and statistically inclined will find it uh, very interesting as far as uh, the nature of their underlying concepts. Some of it is challenging. Some of it is not as challenging. It's just quite remarkable the way things are put together. Uh, again, I'm interested in binary logistics, so I'll focus on maximizing ROC curve, and that's all I need at this point. I click Start, and uh, at this point, the algorithm produced all of those trees. Notice the algorithm and the runtime is pretty fast. And if you look at the two profiles, it shows train test performance in terms of area under ROC. My test performance ROC is now at 75%, which is really a substantial improvement over what I have seen so far. So even without going to further analysis here, it's clear that for this specific data set, Stochastic gradient boosting, and in general, the boosting as a branch of predictive modeling, uh, happens to be superior in terms of accuracy. Now, in many cases, of course, you are not just interested in getting to the accuracy side of things. You also want to understand what happened. And uh, it is uh, quite amazing that in spite of the modeling complexity, of stochastic gradient boosting models. Like in this case, we have 194 six node trees linked together into one lengthy chain. It is still possible to gain additional insights into the internal structural components of that model. Well, first of all, uh, let me see one thing here. Uh, the, three, uh, the three net summary here, if I switch to test, and look at the ROC curve and again increase the number of bins to 30. Now I can, by superimposing all three models that I've had so far, I can see the direct effect of uh, applying stochastic gradient boosting to this specific data set. The blue curve corresponds to tree nut and it is an unambiguous winner over the remaining two types of models which emphasize differently individual parts of the data but fail to uncover the full picture. Now just to be fair it happens on this data set and some other data sets and in particular data sets that say why they have a large number of variables and uh, not as large number of observations. Situations sometimes may reverse and you will get a random forest performing better than a single tree nut model or you may also have some uh, validation difficulties when you don't have the large number of records to begin with. So there are different modeling situations and I wish I had more time to illustrate different data sets but as far as this one goes, this eBay auctions uh, uh, experiment, it looks like the stochastic gradient boosting shows uh, the winning uh, capabilities, and not just marginal but substantial, as can be seen from this curve. So yet again, we are looking at the variable importance list, and where does that, cap that winning capability come from? Well, it looks like the tree nut managed to accommodate 
not just the top important variables that we already know about, but it almost like squeezing out more juice from the presence of those lesser important variables that represent fees and all sorts of other flags out there. Again, we are happy with what we see. We know we achieved our predictive accuracy goal. There's one thing that's still missing, which is understanding how the model reaches to that level. What is it trying to tell us? What kind of interpretational knowledge gain can be extracted from here? Now, in that regard, there is this interesting follow-up to the tree net technology. And let me make a final transition to the slides here. And I will show the final slide for today. And uh, the extra post-processing technology that was developed specifically for stochastic gradient boosting is known now as a partial dependence plot. Even though the technology itself conceptually can be applied to any type of algorithm out there, uh, from the numeric point of view, when you have a tree-based ensembles, uh, the models are represented by ensembles of trees, there is a powerful internal computational shortcut that allows you to eliminate double loop and replace it by a single loop in order to arrive at the partial dependence solution. But the way it works in general is if you're interested in this, in my case, gradient boosting model, and you want to understand how that model behaves with respect to the variable called x1. And the way the partial dependence plots machinery implemented internally is that what you do, you fix all of the remaining inputs to one of the specific configurations taken at random from the data set. And then you vary x1 over its range in order to identify the predicted response. And of course, the current, uh, current uh, predicted response is conditioned upon the values that were chosen for the remaining variables, right? So you want to repeat this process a number of times such that you can generate a number of different individual curves and then average everything together to get the overall uh, tendency of the model response in the way it depends on the specific input of interest. And in fact, you don't have to be sticking with one input. You can select two inputs at a time, and that would produce a 3D plots or anything of that nature. And in general, the technique allows you to disambiguate the contribution of the specific input, in this case x1, as it enters into the black box, once you've accounted for the contributions of all of the remaining inputs. And again, I wish I had more time to go deeper into this subject. We have a, a number of interesting data sets that were artificially created that highlight the interesting and peculiar properties and of this technique to be able to extract signals when they cannot be seen by relying on the conventional uh, scatter plotting techniques or all sorts of projection techniques. The plots are implemented in stochastic gradient boosting. And uh, if you were to embark on writing a stochastic boosting algorithm on your own, uh, it is very important that you have that capability as well because otherwise you can only get a part of the story. So I automatically created all of those plots for this model here that has 194 trees. So I'm, when I look at all of the plots, they're all organized here, I can start making some additional insights. For example, this plot here shows individual iPod categories and how they contribute to the overall likelihood of uh, getting above the average or below the average. As far as it goes in this case, and remember this is a, a German uh, original uh, website, uh, the six gigabyte mini blue collared 
had the greatest contribution to be sold above the average. And again, as a statistician, I'm just claiming things. I'm not trying to explain them or say that the blues are better than anything else. It's just what we read from this data. Whereas the iPod 40 gig, uh, the traditional one, had the, the greatest contribution towards uh, the opposite side, which is below the average. And you can study all of those things uh, to your pleasure. You can even come up with all sorts of reports, marketing stories, get a lot of people intrigued or happy or unhappy. And those are the types of things that make our work as data miners very interesting. It almost feels like you have some uh, supernatural powers. People approach you and you tell them what's going on and no one else can figure it out other than by relying on these uh, powerful tools. And it's really quite exciting that with all these approaches we're finally hitting the point where we can uncover something that is not easily seen. Start price is an interesting curve here. Uh, I remember Single Tree was trying to use the start price around 200 as a cutoff, uh, and uh, it's kind of uh, interesting to see that there's a transition point between here and there. Uh, it might not necessarily be important in this data set, but notice the tree net uh, or stochastic gradient boosting in the more general terms has the capability to reverse dependency. So sometimes, uh, unlike classical techniques that usually assume that the larger something, the greater the impact, or in some kind of inverse form, the modern techniques allow all sorts of reversals. So you can have a reversal here and then the reversal there. Uh, buy it now price, again, the transition between 150 and the 300. More interesting is the customer base, whatever that variable represents. And let me switch to scatter. There's all sorts of different uh, observations there. The variable itself has a so-called long tail, which is why it has this weird shape that is stems from all these points out there. Uh, but if I replace it by something I would call the index plot, where we remove scale of the variable itself and simply show it on the rank order, what you can see from here is a very interesting cap tree net capability to fine cut a variable of interest in this case and try to make the, the best possible prediction based on that. Now, what I find interesting about this approach is that the variable itself is probably not the variable that you want to use as your modeling a variable because the customer base indirectly communicates a specific type of seller. And the reason why you have all these fluctuations up and down is that the data mining machinery sees that there is additional generalized effect that can be extracted from there, but the nature of the variable itself is not quite suitable for interpretation. And it is one of the top most important variables, so the further research would go into trying to understand what kind of signal is being communicated here and whether we can repackage it in a more a useful form and shape. And finally, to finish with this, I'll skip some of the plots, but it's interesting once you go into some of these fees, and it's also important to keep an eye on the scale of the partial dependence. For example, the beginning, the top plots, this is great contribution. It's a 0.5 on a half log odd scale. Same goes here. Once you go into fees, you're an order of magnitude below. But for example, if you put it on a gallery, then there is a, a little bit of positive contribution to the odds of selling above the average. Interestingly enough, if it's featured on IPIX, it's actually negative contribution, even though the scale is somewhat small. And the same thing here, like border fee, bold fee. In general, fees tend to be positively associated with above the average uh, sales. But again, it's really hard 
and it's not a good idea to jump to conclusions right away that some fees are more useful than the others because we're still working within the realm of the specific data set of interest. Okay, so for the most part, this concludes the parts that I wanted uh, to tell you. Uh, I wanted uh, to highlight some of the key steps that we as consultants usually go through by utilizing power of a single tree, tree ensembles, including uh, bootstrap aggregation trees and uh, random forest trees. And uh, now uh, let me see what kinds of questions we have here. Okay, you mentioned you need a test sample for a generalized boosting machine but that a holdout sample wasn't needed for random forests. Why is that? Here is the thing. When you build a tree nut or generalized boosted model, uh, the model always tends to overfit to the learned sample. In other words, if you push it too hard, eventually you'll start explaining random noise pattern. Therefore, a test sample is a must in order to identify how far you should go in order to uh, get to that optimal point. As you can see here, for example, uh, my test performance kept going up, but if you were to look at things like misclassification error, it actually, the error goes down and that starts going back up again. So you need a test sample in GBM in order to get uh, the kind of true estimate of performance. Uh, random forest, on the other hand, is a different beast because random forest, and let's see if I can find it here quickly. In the random forest, what's happening is, uh, this, one, this one here and this one there, here. The random forest performance is the result of combining a large number of independent trees. The thing is, the more trees you combine, the better. And in addition to that, each individual tree is based on a bootstrap sample, which leaves out roughly like more than a third of the original sample. When you build a random forest model, you therefore have access to something known as out of bag validation error and that out of bag can be used by itself as a measure of performance. So the random forest is unique in two specific ways. On one side there is no such thing as optimal model size selection because you know the more trees you generate the better you are. It behaves like tossing a coin experiment. There is no point in trying to reduce the number of trees in random forest. Uh, and on the other side, there is some built-in capability to show the performance anyways, and that's the kind of approach that uh, uh, essentially eliminates the need for the test sample. Now, you may still have it in case you are interested, uh, and it's sometimes helpful, but in general, it is not required. And uh, uh, the other question was uh, overfitting the data for gradient uh, boosting. Uh, again, uh, going back, it's kind of a related question to what I just talked about, uh, but when you look at the tree nut model, it does have a certain amount of overfitting, uh, so the train performance is always better than the test, but as you have also seen from uh, the, the performance in terms of ROC, the test sample performance in this case has 75%, uh, which is way above the performance of a traditional tree. Or in this case, it's even better than the random forest model. Uh, as long as there is no fundamental shift in the underlying nature of the dependency, uh, we expect these models to hold. Of course, we can never be true fortune tellers and expect that all of these models will work great at all times in the future because things inevitably change. But in the end, it's the balance of uh, how much you can extract from the past. You also keep an eye on the, uh, you're trying to validate it in terms of independent holdout sample. And uh, once that happens, you're kind of hoping that you will keep that performance 
in the future. Of course, once something changes, uh, you likely to detect the change, and uh, as soon as that happens, it's best to refit the model and just keep going. We have some clients, and there's some of our consulting projects, when we set up systems, automated systems, let's say if it's online web marketing or ad uh, servers out there, where you basically wait for the new day to finish and then at midnight relaunch model building in order to update all of the underlying models to reflect the most recent piece of information. The next day, the new model kicks in, new portion of information is uh, gathered and that at midnight the model is refit again and then this kind of automated procedure allows you to keep track of things as you go along. Also in spite of the overfitting, Stochastic gradient boosting has been a consistent top performer in all of the major data mining competitions over the past 10 years. The only thing that has any capability to outperform it is once people go into fancy ensembles when they combine lots of different approaches, lots of different teams, and you can see it. It happens all the time on Kaggle competitions. It happened at a Netflix competition. Uh, but at that point, you kind of need to gauge the actual benefit of that squeezing out extra tiny little bit at the cost of enormous increase in modeling complexity. Uh, uh, there's another question. Uh, uh, can I run a random forest on 18 observations but 24 predictors? Uh, yes, you can, uh, even though it's a very small number of observations, but nothing in the random forest stops it from utilizing more variables than observations. Now, you may have some philosophical difficulties justifying the result but the machinery itself can be run. In fact, it can be run in a much larger uh, and more difficult situations, like uh, Random Forest is being very successful in microarray research and genomics. Uh, people would run it on data sets that have, say, 50 or 60 observations and uh, 30 or 60,000 individual variables slash genes. And even though it's very hard to do anything in that environment, you can still run random forest and get a very interesting results as well as variable importance and the gene selection. So random forest is a powerful approach uh, uh, in particular for some specific uh, uh, domain uh, parts. Uh, so, do random forest and boosted trees make single tree approaches irrelevant? What is the role of single tree approach? Okay, I guess I'll use that question as the final, my final closing comments. Here is the thing. Uh, when you look at the single tree, you get at something right away, very quick, and it pops right into your face. In addition to that, you can also tell a nice, compact, and simple story about, in general, what's happening. Granted, you're not getting the top performance in terms of ROC, but in a vast number of areas out there, you're not interested in top performance. You're interested in story. You say if you're interested in what kind of car people are willing to buy and what kind of people, let's say, who is interested in electric cars, who is interested in uh, SUVs, who is interested in, in uh, types of other vehicles. You are not looking to out uh, the top performance. You want a nice, plausible story. You want something that allows you to see variables interplay. In this case, a single tree is a perfect example to show things. Uh, and there's another part of a single tree that uh, I don't have enough time to go into, unfortunately. But the single tree has a very powerful way to handle missing values. When you have a variable with missing values, in turn, let's say the part of income is missing, a single tree can accommodate that situation by dynamically adjusting through mechanism of surrogates to find alternative configurations that can help disambiguate that missing part. For example, the tree would decide, okay, if income is missing, but I know that the person lives in a fancy neighborhood and the income is likely to miss because it's high and not low, and the other way around. 
to the best of my knowledge, this is the only powerful data-driven algorithm out there that has a complete handling of missing values. We use individual trees for missing value imputation before we try to run, say, tree net or random forest or anything else. And in many cases, it works very nicely. We also use single trees to weed out problems with the data prep, let's say variables that are obviously corrupt or variables that don't make any sense or variables that exhibit some other issues with them. Those are easily coming right into your face without a waste of compute time, resources, and effort uh, to discover something trivial. So no, the single tree will always be there. To us, it's a starting point. It's a great auxiliary product and on top of everything, a single tree becomes the internal structural component of the fancier approach like uh, random forest and uh, gradient boosting. Don't forget that the improved accuracy of random forest and uh, gradient boosting comes at the price of unbelievably increased complexity of the underlying model and uh, the, therefore the increased need to try to interpret it and that interpretation is likely to be imprecise at all cases. Okay, hopefully you'll enjoy it. I appreciate uh, your time and if you have more questions, uh, let's just put them down, send them to us and uh, I'll try to address them in the coming days, weeks uh, and uh, you can always uh, keep that in mind. So hopefully you'll have a lot of fun operating on the frontier of data mining and I can tell you once I started working with data mining I realized that the computational power of modern machines is never enough. I always want to have more. Only a few people out there can claim that they really do need that and it's quite exciting to work in the field where we can essentially step into the boundaries of the unknown and uh, be excited and uh, also productive about it. Thank you very much. This is Mikhail Golovnia broadcasting from sunny Southern California on uh, the day of uh, November 9th, 2012. Good luck and uh, hopefully I'll stay in touch and hopefully one day some of you I may see in person. Thank you.